All right, today's discussion, we are going to talk about Chapter 11. So this is the first week back from spring break. Hopefully you had a good time on spring break. Um, Not that we want to just jump into this right away, but we're going to anyway. So this time, this week, we're talking about Chapters 11 and 12. I combined both of those because uh, the chapter on you, Sarah, we're really not going to explore that very much. It, while it does apply, it's not one of the biggies. And so, you know, if you walked out of this class and you can't remember... Um, Anything about you, Sarah, in chapter 12, that's probably okay. All right, but let's go to chapter 11. This covers four big laws that you really want to be aware of as a manager or a business owner. You know, the National Relations, excuse me, the National Labor Relations Act, the Labor Management Relations Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, and the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act are, are four of them that... You know, you may have heard them used in different ways in the past. You may have also used um, some different ways to to talk about them. So some of these things may be familiar, especially if you've worked in a labor or a union type of an environment. Uh, For those of you who have never worked in a labor or, or a unionized environment, you still need to be aware of these things. Many times we think that, hey, we live in... um, Idaho, so it's a right to work state. Um, a lot of times we say, "Hey, it's a right to work state," and and we in, we instead mean that it's a uh, at will state. At will means that you have the right to hire and fire at will, any time and for any reason, and and that is true. But um, uh, a right to work state doesn't mean that. A right to work state really means that as an employee. If a union exists in your workplace and the position that you're working in qualifies for membership in the union, it's ultimately up to you, the individual, to decide whether or not you want to join the union. That's what right to work means. Now, about a third of the states in the country are right to work states. The other ones are typically closed shop states. And in in those situations, um, a certain group of positions... If a labor union exists within an organization, then certain positions are identified as automatically being a part of that union. Now, uh, that way, if you apply for a position and that position is in the union, then if you want that job and you're selected for that job, you have to be a union member in order to get that job. That's what that that closed shop uh, situation is about. But in in the state of Idaho, in a right-to-work state, the union may be present. Yes, unions can exist in Idaho. Um, but uh, as an individual employee, you can decide whether or not you want to join the union. Anyway, I digress. Let's go ahead and go back to the four laws that, that it's talking about. Start with the first one, the Labor, uh, the Labor, uh, sorry, the National Labor Relations Act. The NLRA is governed by the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. Now, they can be your friend or they can be a royal pain in the backside. It depends on where you're at and what you're doing. Now, this is really... It's really to give some guide, so, some protection to employees for their participation in unions. Basically, as a manager or a supervisor, keep in mind that you're acting as an agent of the employer. What that means is anything that you do or say is just as though the employer itself were saying it or doing that type of a thing. So as a manager and supervisor, it's very important that you understand the uh, guidelines within the NLRA because if you violate them and you cross that line, it's you're you're in trouble. Your company's in trouble, and it could uh, could take you down a path you probably don't want to go go down. All right. So as it talks about, you know, there's some guidelines in there on the first couple of pages of the chapter that that gives it an overview. But really, it gives um, it gives guidelines as to how how unions can organize, what their rights are, what the employer's rights are, you know, management rights, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to this, it's really important that you do not discriminate or treat people differently because of their union affiliation. That's the, that's one of the tricky pieces there. And so, you know, some of the the ways that you get into trouble with this is uh, some employees will start talking about uh, organizing a union, bringing a union in. And uh, many employers, when they hear that the first time, they get a little scared. And so they end up firing them because they're talking about a union. You can't fire them because they're starting to talk about a union. That's that's a protected type of a um, type of an activity. In fact, if employees want to get together on their breaks, if they want to meet outside of work and talk about unions, they can do that. <clears throat> now, the other thing about the NLRA is that if uh, if you give the opportunity for people to come onto your premises and and petition or uh, sell things, the union may have the right to come into the workplace and start campaigning. 
even without your permission. So, for example, some things where they uh, get a little sneaky. Um, if you let the um, you know you bring let let employees bring in their kids stuff to buy cookies or cupcakes or candy bars for the local softball team or Girl Scout cookies or whatever. If that's allowed freely, then if a union wants to come in and campaign and drop off their materials too, they may have just as much access if you don't have some kind of policy in place that restricts access or or uh, requires some kind of approval process for them to come in and, and, and have those types of conversations. Anyway, um, this labor relations, the National Labor Relations Act was one of the first pieces of employment law that was established in the United States. Prior to this, the federal government really stayed out of the workplace as much as possible. They tried to not regulate employment or, or po impose any kind of rules on employers because they really tried to create a laissez-faire arrangement where business was business and government was government. But starting in the 30s, this was where the government stuck its finger in the first time and these laws are still in place. So anyway, at the end of the day, NLRA protects employees from appropriate union activities. If they want to join a union, they can do it. Um, if a union comes in and says, hey, we want to organize a union, there are specific rules that the company must follow and that the employees can follow. And it's very important that you don't just say, hey, sorry, get off my property because I'm not going to allow union uh, the union in here. That's not how it works. So anyway, dig a little deeper on that. Anyway, the reason why this came about was because, you know, it, it wasn't that we just started to have labor unions in the 1930s. We've had labor unions for for centuries in different in different uh, structures and in different countries. But, you know, prior to this time, the employers were just treating employees terribly, absolutely terribly. The employees had no rights. They could fire them without worrying about it. If they uh, organized or tried to demonstrate or, or picket or strike, the employer would just fire them all. Um, it was a bad situation. It was, it was a terrible situation. So the NLRA is really designed to help provide protection to employees who want to engage in these types of protected activities. Now, the big thing to remember is that as an employer, you don't want to discriminate against people for their involvement in the union. Uh, you don't want to not hire somebody specifically because they're a, a union member. I remember one interview, I had uh, an individual come in, sit down, and said, you know, let, before we start this interview, let me tell you, uh, my intent is to get hired here so I can come in and start a union. Now, if I use that as the basis for saying, you know, or this, this interview is now over and you're not going to get a job because of that, he could have used that against me and, and you know, gone through, through to the NLRB and created some big legal issues. Instead, I had to say, well, that's nice, but let's take first things first. First, let's conduct this interview and see how you do and see how well you meet our needs. And, of course, in the end, I had plenty of things to clearly demonstrate that he wasn't the most qualified for the job. But don't be surprised when you have some folks come in and say, hey, you know, I'm here to organize a labor union. And if you use that as the basis for um, for telling them why they didn't get the job, that's going to probably turn around and bite you legally. Um, you know, some other things to consider. If uh, an employee is uh, part of a union, you know they're a part of the union, even if it's on their resume and you don't currently have the union or you're opposed to unions, you can't use that information against them uh, through the hiring process or the employment process. So anyway, that's a whole lot of rambling, but I just wanted to let you know kind of what you're up against and some of the things, some of the factors that you need to be aware of. So, all right, let's go to... The next law, which is the Labor Management Relations Act, even today it's more commonly called the Taft-Hartley um, Act, and and so it's, it's it did amend the NLRA. I mean, it was only four years old, and they had to go in and amend it, but it uh, it, it did give the President of the United States emergency powers and, and allowed for other actions designed to protect the nation's general welfare, and. Um, Really, in, in those situations, for example, if you have massive strikes, you have things that are going to ultimately damage the, the homeland security or, or something that, or you know, impose some other kind of, kind of big issue there, the president can actually step in and say, no, you're not allowed to strike. Now, the only time that I can remember this happening within my lifetime is during the Reagan administration. 
And at that time, the air traffic controllers in the country went on strike. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that. Um, but he, he came in and he said, you know what? We've got to have air traffic controllers. It's a matter of, of air safety and national security. And so he uh, told the air traffic controllers, he said, um, you know, you have this many days to come back. I expect you to come back, get back into your job, and we'll go to the table and negotiate. Anybody who does not come back to work by this date is going to be fired. Now, this one got pushed. It got pushed hard saying, hey, you know, the president went, went way too far. The president doesn't have this kind of authority. But, you know, under the Taft-Hartley Act, he does. And so when that deadline came and passed, anybody who did not come back did get fired. It was a massive firing. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. And we had hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of people that lost their job because of that. Now, most of them came back and reapplied and, and um yeah, you know, we're able to to get back into into work, but at at that point, you know, the president did invoke his his powers at that time. It was pretty incredible. Let's go into the third piece, which is the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, this is one of the most important laws that you need to be aware of as a supervisor. The two big things that it talks about are wages and child labor. Let's talk about wages. It establishes a weekly number of hours that are set to constitute a work week. Any work that's performed over those 40 hours needs to be paid overtime, and overtime has to be a minimum of time and a half. Now, you have two types of employees. You have um, hourly employees who fall under this stipulation of the Fair Labor Standards Act, and you also have exempt or professional employees. Those exempt employees are exempt from the overtime standards of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So what that means is you're going to hire them to do a job, but it's understood that you're paying them to work basically on a weekly basis. As you work with them on a weekly basis, then, you know, um, they could be working 30 hours, and in most cases you don't dock them. Uh, now, if they're not meeting at least the 40-hour standard, you can you can discipline them. You can use corrective action, but that's not where we're going with this. What it, what the real focus is is that these employees could be working 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours a week, and they're not eligible for overtime payments. Now, if you know what's best, you're not going to subject your employees to 70-hour work weeks. Uh, that's just ridiculous, and it tends to burn them out pretty quickly. Having worked in one of those environments and not really had a good time with it, uh, I can tell you right now it's not it's not the most desirable situation. Um, anyways, but but I digress. What uh, so so those who do fall under the F uh, Fair Labor Standards Act are subject to overtime for any work that's performed during a seven-day work week. Now, you as the employer, it's important for you to understand what that work week is. You need to establish in your policies that our work week goes from, and most of them say it's, you know, 12.01 on Sunday through 12 midnight on Saturday, on the following Saturday. And that's typically the work week. You need to identify what that work week is so that that way if somebody's working, for example, they work three days for, you know, 15-hour shifts, kind of silly but you know it could happen and it's a monday or excuse me it's a, a, a thursday friday saturday well if they come in and work another 15 hour shift on sunday if you haven't established your work week you may be you know having to pay extra overtime otherwise by saying hey our work week runs from sunday to saturday um, then they can work those 15 hour shifts get their 45 hours in on those three days then when you come in on sunday it starts all over again so you just need to be aware of that. But professional employees uh, or those who are exempt typically are managers, supervisors, um, sometimes IT positions. A lot of sales positions are. There, there's a number of administrative exemptions as well. You can dig deeper into the law if you want to get more into who's exempt and who's not exempt. But that's kind of a tricky question. Now, the other piece to the Fair Labor Standards Act is child labor. And those rules have changed even from the time that the law was written. Uh, the, it, things have changed a bit. And so really back then, I mean, you could have sent your kids off to work and it was legal, but we had way too many kids getting hurt, injured, or killed on the job. So this is really to protect them and, and add some standards. Nowadays, they, they've had missed several iterations of revisions to that law. And because of that, um, it's very, very restrictive. If you tend to, if you are going to hire anybody who's under the age of 18, I strongly encourage you to dig deep into the state laws and the statutes to make sure you're doing it right.
basically if they're at age 18 and out of high school, you can use them however you want. If they're age 18 and still in high school, then there's going to be some restrictions on how many hours they can work during a day, during a week, um, you know, to, to what time of night can they work. Uh, those are some of, the, some of the considerations. If they're under 18... Um, then it gets a lot more restrictive. Now, if they're 16 or over, that's where the restrictions really come in. But if they're under age 16, yeah, you can hire them, but it's excessively restrictive to um, to hire somebody who's under the age of 16, um, unless it's a family member. If it's a family member and it's a family-owned business, that's something different. But if you're talking about hiring teenagers and they're under the age of 16, um, it can get kind of sticky, so you'll want to be aware of those. All right, this final one, number four. Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. This one is, um, you know, it's this one's kind of tough because it's 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 vague, and it does it really doesn't apply in many situations. But where this comes in on the reporting side is it lays out some additional rules of the of rules of the game, so that if a labor union wants to come in or they're currently in the organization, then. Um, you know, this is this is where it goes to the next level. Now, the book talks about the that it, it that you cannot interfere with an employee's right to work, their ability to organize, choose representatives, etc. Uh, the best example of this is probably a company I worked with down in Boise when I was consulting. Uh, they called me in because uh, the supervisor said, "Hey, you know, I hear my employees are talking about unionizing. Can you come in and give me some tips?" And so. You know, we got a little deeper, and sure enough, the rumor mill had started. And, and so I coached him. I said, look, if they provide these interest cards to you, don't accept them. Say that you can't take them, you can't, you, you can't look at them, you can't touch them. And, um, you know, and, and, and really those are those, those interest cards. If the union gets at least 30 to 35% of all the eligible employees to sign one of these interest cards, then they can submit it to the NLRB and ask them to certify those cards and to come um, insist that there's an election that takes place. Once the election takes place, then if 50% or more of the eligible employees say, yes, we want a union, then, you know, they can have the union. What the LMRD covers is, uh, it's, there's a lot of similar language to the NLRA, but it really restricts the employer from going in and doing some things during the campaigning process. So if employers come in with the cards and they say, all right, well, we want an election, you know, you've got to, you got to be careful because there are certain things that you can do and certain things that you can't do. So back to this company, I, I instructed the employer as to what he can do and what he can't do. And his attorney was there and being a typical attorney, who's not a labor attorney, but operates in the state of Idaho, he says, you know, there's nothing to worry about here. Unions don't work in Idaho. They, they, they just, they can't exist. I said, I beg to differ and they definitely can. So anyway, we parted company and about a week later I get the call that says, you know, I have the stack of cards that was set on my desk. What do I do with them? <laughs> uh, from that time forward, uh, we engaged in the campaigning process. The national labor relations board was called, they were contacted and they actually flew up to Boise from Denver to oversee this election process. <clears throat> now, in the end, um, there weren't enough votes to bring in the union, but at that point, I had to instruct the employer as to just how many hands, you know, hand tines that he had. He wanted to go out and, and basically tell his employees that if they didn't unionize, he'd increase their pay. I said, you can't do that. That's an unfair labor practice. He said, well, you know, if we, if we go union, I'll just close shop tell them, you may be able to do that after the fact, but you can't tell them that that's what you're going to do. <laughs> it was pretty restrictive. And unfortunately it was a, it was a tough lesson for them to, uh, to understand. So anyway, where does, where does this get us to? These four laws really talk about common sense approaches to work with your people. When unions come in and they organize, it's typically because there's something that's missing. They may feel underrepresented. They may feel that you as an employer is, are, are not, um, listening to them. You, they may feel that they're somehow uh, working harder than they should or not being rewarded satisfactorily. What I've found is that the employers and organizations who take the time to engage their employees, uh, help them grow, help them develop, and really take care of them, not giving away the farm, but really finding new ways to help them out, are the ones who never have union threats at all. I mean, they really don't. One or two people may bring it up, but it really doesn't grab hold. 
most of the time that I've watched unions organize successfully, it's because the managers are doing something stupid, maybe treating somebody wrong, maybe doing some kind of injustice, maybe the wages are terrible, et cetera, et cetera. But um, from my perspective as an employer, as a manager, if you focus on taking care of your employees, making sure that they're taken care of, uh, and, and actually caring about them, you're probably not going to have an issue that involves these laws um, at that point, you know, at least relating to labor. Fair Labor Standards Act, you definitely want to be aware of that. Make sure that your overtime is your overtime rules are, um, you know, the, the I's are dotted and the, the T's are crossed on that. But really, that's going to be the primary one that you're going to work with. All right, one last reminder. Um, as it pertains to the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, with the wage and hour laws, you need to be sure that you follow these laws. Any kind of overtime that was owed but not paid, any kind of time off that was owed but not given, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can stack up over time. There, there is no statute of limitations on Fair Labor Standards Act violations. So if you owe somebody overtime from 20 years ago, guess what? You're going to have to pay that overtime at today's rates. There is no statute of limitations if you screw this one up. So it could be expensive, could be costly. So just make sure your payroll and your timekeeping uh, processes are up to date and, and, and compliant. So anyway, that's the nuts and bolts of Chapter 11. If you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, on to the next chapter.